<laughs> you could. Well, you started pulling her weight around here. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, I think, welcome everyone. I'm going to kick it off. So uh, good morning to everyone uh, in the Americas. Uh, good afternoon to everyone joining from Europe and Africa. And good evening to those in Asia Pacific. Uh, I'm Julian Gordon. I'm the VP for Asia Pacific for Hyperledger, uh, the open source blockchain initiative at the Linux Foundation. And I'm delighted to be here to introduce this webinar on the important and urgent subject of how blockchain can build a more resilient, effective future for the humanitarian sector. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Hyperledger member BSN, with whom we are collaborating to bring you this webinar today. Uh, we have an amazing panel with us today, an expert lineup of leaders in the humanitarian sector, all exploring how blockchain can benefit this area, which many say urgently needs to build efficiency and trust, reduce costs, streamline supply chains, and so much more. As increasing threats such as pandemics, climate change, and natural disasters require aid dispersed faster, more widely, and more efficiently. So sit back and get ready to listen to this discussion of issues facing the humanitarian sector, how blockchain can help and how you can get involved. If you have questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom chat to submit them. We'll gather questions during the discussion, then we're gonna have a Q&A at the end. And with that, I'd like to hand over to our exceptional panel to introduce themselves and their role in this area. And we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So. I'm going to ask you first, Lucia, please, to introduce yourself. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It's morning for me, uh, calling in from DC. Um, I like to describe what I do, I suppose, as being in the business of democratization. My company is an agency that operates at the, I guess, where international development and emerging technology meet with the goal of democratizing the benefits and access to uh, frontier technologies like blockchain. And outside of my company's work, I dedicate myself to democratizing who gets to build this technology, um, spending a lot of time launching initiatives that involve uh, training or reskilling uh, populations in emerging markets or uh, supporting female uh, founders. So I'm really happy to be here, very excited to have this conversation and to see Rick and Matt again. Thank you, Lucia. That's great. Uh, and uh, Matthew, I think your next alphabetical. Yeah. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Matthew Davey. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Kiva. So for those who don't know, Kiva is kind of a multinational nonprofit. We operate in 94 countries around the world doing microfinance. So we tend to go into areas where financial institutions have not served individuals and find ways to encourage or help them go and serve those individuals, whether that's through, you know, very, very cheap, very risk tolerant capital, whether that's through technical assistance or whether that's through other programmatic work. Um, I also oversee in my strategy role, all of our efforts in emerging technology. We look at the digitization of the last mile as kind of a generational opportunity to help include a lot of people who have been financially and otherwise socially excluded. Um, and if we don't have people in the humanitarian sector actually out at the tip of the spear kind of pushing these efforts, I have a lot of concern that we'll just codify and ossify the systems we have today that have kept these people outside the perimeter. And again, I like to talk about finance because Kiva is about financial inclusion, but the same goes for healthcare education you can go down your laundry list of things that are kind of at the safety net level. There are a lot of people outside the perimeter of those. So super excited to be here. A lot of our work does in the technology group center around blockchain because of its ability to operate in these contexts in a very decentralized manner. And I'll get into more of that later. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. We're looking forward to that. Uh, and finally, Rick. Thank you very much, Julian. And hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, also, a special thanks to, to BSN and to Hyperledger for sponsoring these sort of discussions and getting these topics out there and giving us all a chance to, to get together and, and have these conversations. Uh, my name is Rick Shreves. I serve as the Chief Strategy Officer for a for-profit company called AidTech. And AidTech is, a, I want to call it a startup. We just closed our Series A, though in reality, the company's been around since uh, about 2015 and sits at the intersection of digital ID, digital payments, and uh, blockchain power transparency. Uh, AidTech was one of the early movers in donation transparency with the Irish Red Cross and also has done a number of other projects around the world, uh, including having the very first baby on the blockchain with the blockchain-powered birth registry in Tanzania. Prior to joining ATEC, I served five years as the Director of Emerging Technology at the International NGO Mercy Corps, uh, where I helped lead their blockchain and digital currency initiatives, uh, and also, together with Matthew, have worked on the Libra, uh, now DM, project. Wow. 
great buyers, all of you, right? What a, what a great uh, uh, experiences, right? Uh, and uh, I think we're going to have a great conversation today. So I'm going to start really maybe to set the scene where we are today and maybe firstly define what we mean by the humanitarian sector. So um, I don't know any of you, but maybe, maybe Rick, you could maybe talk about what do we mean by the humanitarian sector for people maybe not aware? What, what, what kind of scope would that, that be? Well, I think generally when that term is used, uh, the assumption is that we're talking about the, the various nonprofit organizations uh, that are dedicated to trying to provide assistance either in the wake of disaster, emergency relief assistance, or by building resilience and vulnerable communities to help insulate them from disaster. Of course, there's a large number of non-governmental actors in there as well, uh, not purely nonprofits. There's a number of for-profit organizations that are focused on the sector and a number of governmental and uh, multi-governmental organizations that also work on this. Um, you know, the fundamental issue is uh, the amount of people in need continues to increase and the amount of resources available for helping them continues to decrease. And that gap is someplace where emerging technologies uh, are able to fill that hole and provide us with a way to leverage those scarce resources to help more people. So I think any organization that's focused on that problem really would be what we would, or at least I would consider to be the humanitarian sector. Okay, excellent. So, um, so what is the, so for those kind of organizations, uh, what, what are the other key kind of challenges today uh, facing those kind of organizations, maybe Lucia or Matthew? Sure, happy to jump in. I think yeah. uh, I would, I mean, there's a list of uh, a thousand different problems, uh, <laughs> but I would boil it down to um, probably like infrastructural inefficiencies um, and then a, a very big barrier around trust that I think has been eroded over the series of years. And, um, and then I would add uh, something, you know, in, along the lines of what Rick is saying that we are seeing an increasing amount of issues, um, people at risk. Uh, we are you know, living through things like a pandemic, which makes more populations a lot more vulnerable. We're seeing change in climate, which is worsening situations for various populations around the world. So I think worsening world context, plus these like infrastructural inefficiencies that have resulted from you know, decades of building very uh, fragmented approaches to solving a problem. There's been a lot of uh, you know, uh, similar organizations doing similar work, but not working together or not building systems that are able to integrate together. Um, and the inefficiency of using these systems with, you know, bootstrap resources that doesn't update them fast enough. And so they're, they may have data or they might have, you know, uh, an approach or a, an intent to use data to solve some of these problems, to learn a few lessons that would solve the problems more effectively, but an inability to really uh, develop the infrastructure that would allow for that to take place. Um, and then I think the trust one is just, you know, both transparency and also just the way that resources have been managed over time. I think um, the erosion of trust is probably something that uh, we need to keep at the forefront when designing these kinds of interventions that the three of us seem to work on. Um, and then um, and then thinking through the ways in which the technology uh, can enable more trust, more transparency, more visibility into the ways uh, that these interventions are done. And maybe I, I can definitely add on to that, you know, following on the like the technology and the infrastructure and the systems, like one of the challenges for the humanitarian sector is really trying to do no harm. And that leads to the humanitarian sector tending to lag when it comes to technology. So when interventions could be much more efficient, could be much faster, could leverage modern technology, it's easy to point a finger and say, yeah, well, you're using 2011, you know, systems for a 2021 problem. And I don't want to fault the humanitarian sector for this because when mistakes are made for a lot of us who are on this webinar, it's a nuisance. It might cost us some money to restore. It might be a nuisance to go and find how to get access to your account or you didn't get your social protection payment and you can go and have a grievance and, and you're, you're not going to go bankrupt. Your family's not going to go hungry because of that. You can't let those problems happen in the humanitarian sector. Those things can actually be very devastating to individuals and populations. And so I think one of the biggest challenges is how, how as a humanitarian sector, can we figure out how to leapfrog faster? How to, we want to experiment with blockchain. How do we experiment more quickly? How do we get it so that we can actually roll out to larger scale populations with these interventions, as opposed to only doing these small controlled trials. And by the time we move on to say, okay, we now know causation, correlation, like what's going to happen when we do these things. Now let's roll the population. Well, that crisis is over. And, and, I, and I think that that's why you see a lot of humanitarian agencies do really well in crisis intervention, 
um, but not well in crisis prevention because it, it's hard to catch up. I don't know if that or makes better sense. better technology has come around. And so by then the technology right. is already good, and especially at this rate of innovation, right? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been places in sub-Saharan Africa where they have all of these smart chip cards that have now just spoiled sitting in warehouses because they didn't print them fast enough. Um, like they were going to get them, there's going to be election, they were going to do a, a pan West African identity card and like, like, a, like an EU type identification card and the countries didn't get aligned fast enough to get it done and they spoiled. Literally like the chips on them went bad sitting in a human warehouse. Um, these are the types of things that like, have to figure out how to not have those things happen because that was wasted many millions of dollars in a gigantic effort on that. And that's just one case that happens every day. Okay, so 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 how does how does blockchain or how could blockchain you think um, be deployed in the humanitarian sector to, to help these these issues? I think we talked about trust. We talked about the challenges of intervention, right? Um, so maybe uh, Rick. Sure, happy to talk about it. Uh, there's a couple of things that I'd, I'd highlight here, and um, and certainly both of the other panelists have have really some good insights on this. So I won't monopolize the entire topic, but I think the first and most obvious thing is is the use of digital currencies, right? Which is a blockchain power technology or a distributed ledger powered technology to be more accurate about that. Uh, and the use of digital currencies in cash transfer programmings, in the receipt of donations, in the tracking of donations, giving you the transparency layer as well is super interesting and has the potential to do a couple of things for the sector. First and foremost, it should be able to allow us to deliver that cash-based aid uh, more cheaply and more quickly. It should also give us a better audit trail for the movement of those funds and help us decrease fraud. So it should give us better, better visibility on the movement of those funds, which is oftentimes a very big issue with the NGOs. And additionally, from the front end side, from the donation side of things, it gives us a way that a donor can actually track the movement of those funds. Now, some NGOs have been reluctant to go down that path, uh, not because they're up to anything dodgy, but simply because it's really a complete revision of the way that they handle the flow of monies coming in and going out of the agency. So what we, what we talk about there really is the potential of this technology to realize that big change. Uh, finding uh, major NGOs who are willing to swap over their operations and, and modify the way that they do things is quite a challenge. There are some, some startup NGOs that are looking to disrupt the sector that are doing some very interesting things in this space. Uh, and I think that, that the jury's still out on whether the big NGOs are going to react to that or, or whether these smaller NGOs are, are going to wind up disrupting the sector as a whole. So there are a number of other things uh, that blockchain can do, uh, more traditional things such as supply chain management, et cetera. But I'm going to stop there because I know the other panelists have things to say about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you laid a good beachhead there, Rick, on it. And I, and I think, you know, there's examples of humanitarian sector and NGOs and multinationals, you know, experimenting with this technology. One, one I like to use is a World Food Program has something called building blocks that they're using to actually par partially for cash transfer, but you can also then, you know, give someone a QR code via blockchain that can be used to redeem for a sack of rice. So it's not just for money, it can be for any type of thing that there's supply chain of money or supply chain of food or other goods. Um, and I think it's really important in the humanitarian sector how, how blockchain, again, and we talk about the potential of it because none of this stuff is at massive scale in the sector, which, which can be a little frustrating to those of us who see these pilots in action and then see all of the damage being done by not rolling this out to larger scale. But just to make the example, like with, with refugees, they're currently a citizen of no country. Um, so when you try to think about whether it's your rice you're trying to get to them, whether it's money you're trying to get to them, the traditional systems don't work. And this is where blockchain is really interesting because blockchain, you can say, I'm going to park this voucher for rice, or I'm going to park this $10, you know, social protection payment at this address. And then there's a system to let someone access that address and redeem it without me having to have them open a bank account, have an ID card, a whole litany of other things. If you play that out at scale, you could build very efficient systems where all the way at the donor level, you have visibility like this was supposed to go to Matthew and it actually got to Matthew and Matthew's spouse did not take the money. The money was not grifted along the way but also then gives that individual that privacy and control that they need. And then all the intermediaries, you know, a UN agency would be very reluctant to give full audit to anybody over their databases because of the type of sensitive information that's in there. So there's a lot of potential there, but I think to, you know, where Rick was starting, like all this stuff is at such an early stage. And for those of us who are deep in the kind of humanitarian and technology space, 
it can be quite frustrating where you're like, everybody, this is faster, this is cheaper, this is more secure. And the crisis is today. Can we please expand this program? I think that the other thing, the other component of the technology that we have to be talking about more is the smart contract component, right? Specifically because of the power that it has to enable these kinds of really fragmented ecosystems to come together in limited ways that allow for collaboration to actually take place without necessarily opening up your entire uh, or changing the entirety of the way that you operate, right? And so the I think the uh, migration and refugee re uh, resettlement example is great because essentially you're dealing with a population that isn't citizen, but that receives services from literally, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of different agencies, organizations on the ground, uh, community-led initiatives, the UN, uh, UNHCR specifically, or, you know, uh, the World Food Program, et cetera. So you're talking about this, like, huge ecosystem, all trying to help the same population um, in different different ways. And there, and then we have a redundancy of data. We have a lack of transparency of how it is even flowing through all of this and how, you know, function is even flowing through all of this because, you know, redundancy of data is a big thing where you, and it's a vulnerability for people if you are collecting, you know, for one database and then you're recollecting for another database and who knows how that one is secured. So when I'm thinking about its potential in the humanitarian sector, I think about it in layers of, Yes, absolutely. The ledger and payments and, uh, you know, this ability to trace not just uh, the value that we think of immediately, which is money, but also the value in other forms, uh, such as identification, such as food goods, such as a uh, healthcare uh, services, etc. But then on top of that, building the right mechanisms to automate the workflow within which we distribute all of these services and all of this aid that is tied back to its traceability. So I think um, building the ecosystem that allows for function um, and for collaboration is uh, one of those things that is uh, something we can start working on at larger scale because of the ability to sort of automate these workflows and to connect some of these ecosystem and ecosystems in ways that they hadn't been able to do before. So I think the real starting point for us has been to f identify these places where multiple organizations are willing to uh, cross, you know, function some data or use some aspect and then build a little bit of enablement through smart contracts there and then work our way into like more depth of collaboration over time um, to build the trust that is necessary to be able to do that. Okay, that's excellent, right? So yeah, we, we've covered a lot of things there, right? Supply chain, uh, some cryptocurrency, um, we talked about smart contracts, um, we talked about, uh, you know, many, many things. Um, uh, so but I think it's really very much starting, right? Uh, it sounds like it's very nascent uh, and uh, uh, early days, right? So, but could you, do any of you have specifics of what you've done in your organizations? Any any more specifics about uh, what you've done with blockchain in your organizations? So, yeah, I can. Yeah. I, I mean, Stop. quickly, you know, yeah. Kiva has been working with decentralized identity um, using blockchain, using Hyperledger tech. Hi, I'm here with all the Hyperledger folks. Um, but you know, one of the big problems is ability of individuals to identify themselves. So we've actually found that blockchain systems can be very effective in vulnerable areas. So Sierra Leone, as an example, you know, 5 million adults, 7 million, 7.5 million total population. Of the adults, 18% have a bank account of some kind, even a basic savings account. And when you start digging that back, one of the primary reasons for that is lack of their ability to identify themselves to open an account. So we've actually been building on top of Hyperledger Indian Aries blockchain systems, and now there's a national digital identity platform in Sierra Leone that, they, that any individual, any adult in Sierra Leone can use with just a thumbprint to go and authenticate and remotely pull down their credentials. And what's neat about this system is the kind of the consumer protections that you can build in with blockchain, that this individual, like I can't go, even as an employee of Kiva, helping Sierra Leone as we've stood up the system, I wouldn't be able to go in and access their data. The only way I can unlock is through them sovereignly putting their thumbprint on and it shows the consent, here's what you're gonna share. And at that point it unlocks and shares it. And so what's really interesting is being able to get not only a solution in the field, but a very resilient solution for those individuals. So we're using it in that, and that's kind of a beachhead for us then to be able to start add on more financial products and services. Like how do we build an ecosystem where then it's easier and we can encourage more banks to open bank accounts for these individuals to make it easier for them to send and receive remittances and receive the types of humanitarian relief that plenty of them receive. So that's our example. Okay, and I think we're gonna go a little bit more into self-sovereign identity later, right? Uh, more into the under the bonnet of what's happening there. Um, yeah. 
Lucia or Rick, anything, any other ones that you want to add? Sure, I mean, yeah. we've been using it uh, in also different ways, some in the identification uh, space as well, um, and more geared toward resettlement and uh, reskilling for potential employment. So a lot around, you know, what is the, the type of data that we even need to collect in order to enable a domino effect of benefits? So is it, okay, we don't need certain types of data because the goal is really to get them resettled and then to destroy um, sort of the, the data that we've ever collected because it's served its function. So really working through the way to design systems and piloting these systems in uh, the Mexican American border um, with the undocumented immigration uh, crisis that happened, that has been happening uh, for the past couple of years. Um, and then successfully sort of being able to support the uh, resettlement of about 3,500 in our pilot um, in order to scatter throughout Mexico with a job offer already in place so that they could start working immediately. Um, so it was really like a functional based identification that had a limited uh, place in the world, but it was really just to get from point A to point B, which was to have uh, status, recognized status in Mexico and uh, to be able to have a, a job offer. Um, and on the flip side of that is this notion of you know, more permanence in profiles. So uh, some of the work that we've been doing in Africa along the border of the DRC has been to help farmers sort of officially map out uh, land that they had already distributed and organized themselves. So a big, you know, philosophy, at, at least in, in my company, and I know that both Rick and Matthew abide by is sort of like, you know, we don't need to come in and do stuff sometimes. It's already been done. The community has been, you know, living in that area for a while. They have their own. And just because they're, it's not official in a document or it's not recognized by a government agency, that doesn't mean that they don't have a way of operating. And so they were being, you know, successfully farming food um, and they had distributed how that was going to work. And so all we did was come in and sort of support their mapping process um, and build a sort of like a land claim um, that system that now the uh, Ministry of Agriculture in both countries that are sort of uh, relevant to that border uh, are, are using to determine who's growing what where. Um, so those are some examples of the stuff we've done with blockchain. That's very interesting. So there's an informal system already set in place. So you, you came and helped formalize that oh, through technology? Yeah. And there's obviously always a very big danger when it comes to assets like land where, you know, if you do come in with surveyors and there's a lot of opportunity for corruption, there's a lot of opportunity for like retitling or redrawing lines and borders, uh, which we were very mindful of. And so it was really just like mapping out what they specifically already had arranged. And I think that that's probably um, why we were uh, so happy with the, the outcome of, of the system, because it, it was inherently non-invasive and it was really just providing the technology for what they already have organized for years. That's excellent. I mean, a lot of people I know, actually, I think Brian always says that that's one of the reasons he came in for that use case, right? To help protect people uh, through the land rights. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a great case. Uh, sorry, Rick. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, from the aid tech perspective, I mean, the company's been around for uh, five years plus and, and across that time has done a number of different trials and, and, and use cases around the world. Uh, Save the Children, Red Cross, Women's World Banking are all clients. Uh, I'm just going to highlight one here because it, it dovetails nicely with, with the presence of Hyperledger, which is the Transparency Engine project, which is powered by Hyperledger Fabric. And the Transparency Engine combines digital ID and digital payments into a mobile app that allows uh, the distribution of aid quickly and with good traceability uh, in a variety of different contexts. And that's been deployed in several places around the world. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention, and I wanted to mention this one because Lucia had raised smart contracts. It, it's not actually an aid, an aid tech project, but I think it's one of the more interesting things that's happened in the sector recently. And it comes from the Danish Red Cross. It was the creation of a catastrophe bond uh, tied to volcanic events that automatically releases the funds when an oracle verifies that a volcano has occurred. So it is actually an insurance policy or a relief policy, if you will, because it, it isn't actually for uh, directly for the people impacted that is triggered by smart contracts linked to an oracle. So the funds are already set aside. They're already earmarked for the event if it occurs. When that event occurs, the funds are released immediately. So instead of the usual days, weeks, sometimes even months before aid actually gets into the hands of the local agencies who can provide relief to people, this sort of blockchain powered system uh, can get that relief to them while the event is still happening, which is just a, a sort of the holy grail on the emergency relief side of things, right? Being able to pre-position aid so that you're able to help people and get it to them ASAP. Uh, you know, because it's that 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 pain period between the event and when the aid arrives 
that so many bad things happen in these places with the vulnerable population. So just a, a hat tip to Danish Red Cross and that work. It's some of the most forward thinking work in the uh, sector that employs this particular technology. And I did want to raise that with the group. I think that's a great and awesome case study, right? And that's really, that's, well, that's linking with the insurance sector as well. So that's other sectors helping, uh, helping the humanitarian sector, right? So someone prepared to take the risk from a volcanic activity uh, and then that being happening immediately without all the paperwork. So yeah, that, that's, uh, uh, that, 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 that's some great, 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 great examples, all three of you, right? <laughs> so uh, what, is, what, what, is, what is, the, is, is, is missing now? What, what's, what's the kind of next step? What, what can we do in the future? What's the, what's the next kind of, uh, uh, you know, what other kind of solutions are you looking at? Or what other kind of use cases do you see for the humanitarian area? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm happy to jump in. I'm, look, you know, trying to narrow down specifically to blockchain. Yeah. You know, I think that, you know, five years ago and three years ago and even a year and a half ago, there were a lot of places where you saw a solution looking for a problem. Um, where it's like, yeah. you know, people saying, I have a blockchain team. How do I blockchainify this thing that I'm working on? And I think as we've started to see these pilots, and, and I love, Rick, by the way, that Danish Red Cross yeah. example is amazing. Um, and we've talked about that before. Um, I think now people are realizing what the unique characteristics of blockchain are and how they might actually unlock better resilience, better disaster response, you know, but better protections for individuals. So when I look forward and say like, how do I see blockchain coming more to the humanitarian sector? I think it's actually saying this problem that I've had for a long time that I've been putting duct tape and band-aids on, there actually is a really, really good solution for that. You know, Lucia, you mentioned land registries. There's lots of these developing countries where there's four formal land registries and none of them are accurate. And the actually accurate one's the informal one where you can go to a village and they all know who owns which plot. Blockchain is really well suited to that because you can take each of those individuals, again, the kind of trust in a trustless environment. You can let them all become issuers of credentials. They're each issuing their own credentials. That gives you an audit trail that then you can say, now look, now I can see every claim. And you can go back to the analog days of like, you know, an individual walks onto a refugee camp with no identification. How do you figure out their name? You get 15 people they walked onto the camp with at the same time and say, on three, all of you jump and say this person's name. And 13 of the 15 say Matthew and two of them say Mike. And they say, congratulations, your name is now Matthew. And it's most likely correct, unless they were all colluding to trick what your name is. You can do the same thing with the property rights. You're going to have five, six, seven, eight probably six of the eight claims will line up and it'll be pretty clear who actually owns that property. Um, so I, I think, you know, those types of use cases where you're going to see, oh, the trustless and trustless environment, the, the trust in a trustless environment, the multi-issuer, the interoperability, the ability of like, I have a birth certificate, but not a national ID, or I have a national ID, but not a birth certificate. The ability to take these multiple participants and not force them to come to an agreement, let them all participate in the system and then you can figure out what the, which source of truth you want to use. Again, same as the example I use, like I could pull out a gym card that might say Matt, my driver's license and passport that say Matthew, and you know, a dining rewards card that might say just M for my first initial. Um, and all of those are valid and they don't have to care about each other. So you're going to see a lot, of, a lot of that where there's these like systems that have had a hard time working together that blockchain will allow them to work together. I hope we see a lot of that. And I hope we see it in education and property rights and healthcare obviously in financial services. Okay, actually, just take a step back. Um, uh, uh, one thing we discussed actually about crisis is, uh, do, you, do, you, do, you see, do you think we've learned anything from the crisis we're having today, COVID-19? Uh, and has that made any, any impact on the kind of work that NGOs are doing? Maybe Lucia, would you be able to? Sure. Um, also, this is, I'm still thinking about Matt's answer because I really appreciate it. And also, yes, that was exactly the process that we used for what we did in, in uh, Uganda DRC. Um, and there's a, like a reputational component that I think comes yeah. into play that is really important. Um, okay. And I think the same thing uh, sort of happened with the pandemic. It was, you know, we were stressed. It was a stress test for the entire world, which we utterly failed. Um, and I think the openness within which the pandemic has sort of um, forced onto a lot of organizations, uh, government uh, agencies and ministries that now are like, well, you know, we are the healthcare ministry. We were completely out of our depth and so many people within our population suffered. Like we need to come to a reckoning here and figure out how we're gonna do this better, 
you know, and more effectively. And so I think uh, one of the things that I think was actually a potential opportunity, or I don't want to call it a positive because it really, it came at the expense of so many people, but inherently like organizations or ministries that I had um, seen more cautious or more closed-minded about the potential of the technology sort of say, okay, well, maybe I need to just understand this better. Um, and that change in attitude and disposition has been a very interesting opportunity and has allowed for um, the types of uh, understandings of problems that Matt is describing is essential is in saying like now we are actually receiving more problems as opposed to before it was our sector and our organizations coming to or others and saying we have a potential solution for what we understand of your problem. Um, there was a complete shift in uh, attitude and saying hey I have a problem maybe you're one of the solutions and so I think this. Uh, this change in, in mentality has been helpful. Um, that said, I also think that a lot of the discussions around privacy services distribution, um, what the, how much information does the government need have? How much do NGOs need have in terms of the information um, has come to the forefront and it's now becoming important to people that before maybe would not have valued it at a high degree. So, you know, if you're thinking about uh, economic development there are stages in which it's more important to you to have access to a service or to receive a benefit than it is for you to worry about the detail and what that costs you. Um, or even like in leisure, like in with Facebook, like do people really read the terms and conditions? They just want to be connected to their friends and whatever. And so we signed on to these terms and conditions and we didn't really care much about everything else. And then there was a reckoning and it was like, hey, how much data does Facebook have on me? And like on my friends and what did I permission through these terms and conditions? And so I think uh, the narrative of this matters now to everyone and I'm, you know, working with uh, a lot of on the ground groups uh, in uh, Asia in relation to the Rohingya refugee crisis, they're asking the privacy questions and I think that it's, um, it's been very interesting and I know we're going to get into into sovereign ID, but I just think it's been interesting the changes that this pandemic has created in one this shift of mentality institutionally, but then personally, how people are actually thinking about hey there's technology that is coming. Are we, do we, you know, what is it going to cost us and what is it going to take from us and what is it, and this like degree of suspicion with, you know, what they hear in the media. And so I think the pandemic has really released an interest in technology that is bringing up more uh, deep conversations about the meaning of what we're doing next. And I think that's been, you know, overall a net positive in my, in my book. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, if I can, yeah. if I can just add a couple of thoughts Please. on that. I mean, right at the beginning of the pandemic, when it became apparent that, you know, the, the contagion was was really a factor, well, then immediately a lot of the NGOs had to rethink how they were delivering certain types of services. Because a lot of times, you know, that, that, that service, that aid is delivered by bringing together a large group of people into a physical space and keeping them there while you do the processing and, and the aid distribution. So it really gave a, a great deal of impetus to the movement to uh, support remote program delivery. And one of the places where this has, has gotten some traction in the space that does actually use this technology is in direct cash assistance. Uh, where it would be high, high risk to bring a group of individuals together to either give them physical cash or printed vouchers uh, if they have access to a phone, even, even just a feature phone, not necessarily a smartphone. Uh, there are ways that you can deliver that assistance to them remotely, and we have seen an increase in interest in that type of programming. Uh, similarly, we've also seen an increase in interest in micro work and other ways that people can continue to earn money despite the lockdowns. So we have seen a few things come out of this, but I think that like any other sector, I think what we're seeing right now is that, that the COVID crisis, we all thought was going to give a big impetus for this move to digitization of service delivery. Um, and it's probably not quite lived up to what we were hoping would occur, right? But it, 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 like Lucia says, the conversations are happening now and people are seeing the value and going, oh, wow, we need to be prepared if something like this happens again. And these sort of modalities are a way that they can address at least some of those of practical problems that are imposed by uh, things like quarantine and highly contagious or dangerous environments. You like and anything, Matthew? I think, yeah, quarantine, obviously, yeah, it has changed a lot of things, yeah. right? I think change shifted the mindset. Uh, well, I th I, and I think it more broadly did, you know, a lot of times in the past, the crises, it doesn't make it unsafe for individuals to get together to play off of what Rick was saying. But I think that's always an underlying current. The more vulnerable you get, either the harder or the more dangerous it is to try to reach the actual beneficiaries you're trying to reach in the humanitarian sector. And so I think, you know, NGOs thinking about that and looking at how do I remotely serve individuals? And not just because I have to in the pandemic, but because even in a post-pandemic world, like having these individuals 
walk on foot four miles each way to pick up this voucher, to pick up this cash assistance. Like if I don't have to have them do that, it's more equitable to not have them do that. And so that, that's where I think, you know, to Rick's point, I, I think COVID hasn't lived up to forcing the digitization the way we thought it would. I do think it's accelerated. So on the tail of this, I still, still think we'll see rapid digitization of that last mile. But I think that's a place where, and again, blockchain is really well suited for that, for all the reasons of decentralizing trust and making it so you can park things at an address, make sure only the right individual has access to that address, and they can pull it down in whatever context they're in. But that that remote servicing is going to be a huge thing going forward, that the pandemic really, this was a problem ahead of time. It was just a problem we were able to deal with. And the pandemic kind of said, we have to find ways to not to not do it the way we've been doing it. Okay, so uh, so it has helped, uh, hopefully mindset, right? But uh, uh, and hopefully, I mean, I've seen it. You know, the, the whole promise of digitization, right? It's, it's it's accelerated. You know, some people had a plan to do stuff by twenty thirty. This is in the non humanitarian sector. Suddenly, they're implementing their twenty thirty plans, right? Because <laughs> we need to digitize today, right? But uh, um, so, how can how can uh, NGOs better prepare then for next crises? Are there things that they can do now, uh, out, out of those lessons? from uh yeah I, i'll jump in there i think really there's there's a couple of, of real practical nuts and bolts issues that, that are holding back the rate of adoption in the sector uh one of the big ones is is the lack of expertise within the sector right it's it's quite hard to obtain the the personnel the physical talent the people who understand how to build these systems and how to design these systems and second also very very closely related the programming people within the NGOs, by and large, obviously there's exceptions in places like Kiva, they don't understand how to design programs to, uh, in, to take advantage of these technologies. And so if, if your program people aren't designing programs and building this into the programs when they go off and seek the grant funding, well, then there's no funding for it. And so they don't deploy it. And it becomes you know sort of a vicious chicken and egg kind of cycle, right? So my point is, is that capacity building within the NGO sector is really one of the huge keys to seeing the expansion of this technology's footprint within the sector. And I'll, I would, I'll tack on, like a lot of people look at, well, my NGO is, doesn't have enough funding to have an innovation group or my, you know, there, there's a bunch of reasons, you know, for those that are scaled enough and Kiva happens to be scaled enough that we can have our own internal team. But even in the absence of that, you don't have to be able to run all these experiments on your own. There's plenty of communities. I'll put in a plug for Hyperledger. Like you can yep. get some of your developers who are not working on blockchain and say, hey, I want you to spend eight hours a month in the community at Hyperledger. Like spend the first three months seeing what's there in Hyperledger and then filter down what are the projects, like which Hyperledger projects, and you can go to any of these open source communities, but like which Hyperledger projects are probably most relevant to us and you can have, you know, an army of one who's spending, you know, one thirtieth of their time leaning into the sector. And you can actually learn a lot because you'll see the pilots that Kiva is doing. You'll see the stuff that Aid Tech's doing, the stuff that Emerge is doing. You'll, you'll get to see all these things. And again, then you can be in a situation where you're not the NGO with a solution looking for a problem. You're an NGO that hits a problem and says, hey, I've, I've seen how we can do this in a better way. Like, and I think that will help where, where blockchain can help these NGOs be better prepared, especially when it comes to emerging tech solutions for these crises. Yeah, I also think capacity building by nature, of, like through partnerships, right? I think, uh, you know, start, the startup space and the NGO space have been historically at odds because of timing. Um, because for a startup who's, you know, possibly early stage, they're looking to get a contract. They're looking to work on a project, a proof of, like show something deliverable because then they can turn around and raise a series A, you know, or um, they're, they're looking for growth and scaling, right? So that needs to move at a much faster pace than the NGO space has to because they have to be more measured because of the potential ramifications of deploying anything too early or too, um, you know, uh, too unbuilt per se. And so the fact that these two timings have never aligned, I think, the pandemic has changed that in a certain way where like, I think there's a, a greater understanding of the sense of how much timing is holding both sides back in the humanitarian sector specifically. And so finding ways to develop stronger partnerships and thinking also in terms of like futures in the way that this Red Cross project is sort of like a future based uh, initiative. I think that might be an interesting way to sort of develop the right kinds of partnerships so that if you don't have the resources to capacity build, if you don't have a developer that can go into a Hyperledger community 
um, and understand what's going on. If you don't have um, any capacity or internal IT team, then you can still tap into that with the right kinds of partnerships um, that are oriented toward capacity building. And then the other um, thing I would say is, you know, the fact that a big a big question in a lot of tech companies' minds is like the ecosystem is not hard, is not easy to understand. Like Matt, you know, Rick and I have spent a lot of time in the development sector, in the humanitarian sector. Um, other tech companies have not, but they have a lot of value to add to potentially improving some of these solutions. And I think any work that can be done that is non-technical, that is really healthy for the space of humanitarian technology or aid tech or whatever we want to call it, is this notion of like, how do we map out the ecosystem of the problem that we're trying to solve? How do we map out and provide as much non-technical information as we can so that if there are techni uh, technical companies, hackathons, communities that want to work on components of problems within the open source community, that there is greater understanding of a world that is obscure to them right now. Um, and I think that's really valuable. And I think it would accelerate the pace at which uh, innovation can flourish without necessarily being intentional or contracted. And I think that would also be very healthy for the space. Okay, so it sounds like open source is also, uh, we're talking about obviously Hyperledger is open source. So, so is open source something that, that that's that's really helped the humanitarian space and you see a, a space there to, to continue be a support to your work? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, at Mercy Corps, for example, we were we were pro open source, and it was it was part of our, the values within our, our technical teams there. Uh, not only because it allowed us to tap into the broader community, but it also allowed us to give back. Uh, and so, yes, open source is absolutely key. I think. And I would say same for Kiva for those exact reasons. And I'll add like a lot of the stuff we're doing in blockchain and in technology, we're trying to hand these systems over to local capacity and. I personally believe it's a disservice to hand them closed source stuff where you're going to have specific vendor lock-in um, as opposed to giving them open source where then locally they can modify, they can maintain this. So not only is it cheaper, it's just frankly better if it's open source for these individuals because then they can branch it and move the directions they want to move with it. Same, same for us. And I think it's realistically the way to onboard and to successfully get buy-in when it comes to uh, NGOs or, or government organizations that have been using certain technology, it's much easier for them to bring it on board or to uh, build the capacity if it's something that is already out in the ecosystem that they can have, you know, their teams sort of look into and, and then uh, prepare for as we migrate over to their, uh, to their system. So, yeah. Well, that's great to hear. So, uh, and it's great, as Rick said, uh, contributing back as well, and Matthew, so uh, that, that, that's, that's wonderful. It's a it, it, that's that's what open source is all about. Uh, so let's focus now maybe on, on a subject I think we picked up at the beginning, self-sovereign identity. And I think Lucia may not like that name, but uh, <laughs> we'll get to that. So, so Matthew, maybe as, as an expert in the in space, you can talk a bit about what self-sovereign identity is and, and how Kiva has very much been a leader in this space. And self-sovereign during this pandemic has become to the fore as, 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 as a technology, definitely. Yeah, and, and self-sovereign, Lucia, I, I think it's come now full circle where like it got, it got used wrong, got painted in the wrong light, and now I think it's a little more neutralized in terms of what it is. But you know, at its core, just for those who don't know, self-sovereign identity is, if you want a like, technical de definition, it's an identity system where I could actually issue a, a, an identity for myself. I can say I'm Matthew. And I actually think that's right as a, as a base construct, that I'm Matthew. It doesn't matter who somebody else says that it is. I'm Matthew. Now, Obviously, to go do things in the real world, we have to have a trusted party. Like, you know, everybody on everybody on this panel here knows me well enough that I could probably self-issue I'm Matthew and you're fine with that. But for others, like for somebody Julian knows, his friend who has never met me, maybe he's a trusted intermediary and he can say, hey, I want you to meet my friend Matthew. And then that person says, cool, like I trust that you're Matthew. And maybe he trusts lending me 10 bucks to buy coffee. Probably doesn't trust enough to give me money to buy a car and trust that I'll pay him back. It's like, so as the need for trust goes up, the need for a trusted issuer of identity goes up. Okay, so there's self-sovereign identity. Um, anybody can be an issuer. So why is this really important? Well, I think when you think about these vulnerable contexts and you think about, hey, we're, we need to digitize, we need to get them digital identity. There's really two ways to do it. There is the way that we've done digital identities traditionally, which is there is a centralized server and you log in through that server and like that server owns your identity and they happen to lease a copy of it to you. So you can use it to log in or authenticate or something else. And, and we did that because back when the internet was started, people didn't have a supercomputer in their pocket. They didn't have a, an internet connection. Like it was infeasible to actually do what we have in the analog world of handing someone a physical card 
and saying, take this physical card with you and use it when you need to identify yourself. And in the rare instance that someone needs to verify that I actually issued this to you, like the passport agency, then here's how they can call me or make a server call to me to verify that that is still valid. You can do that digitally today. And so self-sovereign identity, if you play out to what is it actually today, the best mental model I have for folks who aren't super familiar is exactly that. Like, I wanna give you a digital wallet and I wanna give you a digital credential that is just like a physical driver's license or a physical passport, but it's digital. And I'm gonna give you the, the ability, you sovereignly, without asking me permission, you to share that credential or pieces of that credential, your birth date, your first and last name, your, your address, to share that at your discretion. And I'm gonna provide an avenue that if that person says, well, I can see this was issued by the US passport office, but I wanna verify they haven't revoked it. Like giving them an avenue to be able to call back and verify. And, and so that's what you're seeing out in the wild. That's, and, and honestly, that's a much better solution. Why is that so important? Well, think about the world's most vulnerable. Think about a refugee. They're running out of Syria to Jordan to a UNHCR camp. We talked about how they show up on the camp. They've had to burn their passport so they don't get caught with it. So like that physical credential is gone. You can't call the government of Syria because they're oppressing. They've already deleted the record out of the, out of the servers in the country or they're not going to share it. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a digital version of the passport that the person can run? They're not carrying it. They don't have to burn it. They can get to the UNHCR camp and they can authenticate in and say, hey, HCR, I can prove to you that the government of Syria issued me this, or I can prove to you I was a doctor. How many doctors become refugees and end up not being able to practice medicine or even provide basic medical like, like first aid support because the proof that they are a doctor or an attorney or you know pick your profession has vaporized when they left? Self-sovereign systems, decentralized systems allow that to happen. And I realize I'm, I'm going to get off topic if I keep going, but like that's the true power of self-sovereign identity is you can today you can actually digitally give the person a copy and they can keep it. And, and that's hugely powerful for, for populations where trust in government might be low or where they might exist in multiple modalities or they might cross borders frequently. It's, it's a really cool thing. No, so I'm, my, uh, just for uh, clarification, my uh, background is actually in non-digital identification documentation. So I come from the world of like issuing. Um, and so uh, I think the real problem that I have with the with the term itself is number one, uh, the ways that it is unconsciously defining what digital identity means for the future. And um, I think I sort of uh, talked a little bit about this, Julian, earlier today. And I know that Matt, you've heard me talk about it, but um, the way that we defined identity and identification when it was uh, first uh, like conceptualized in a national ID kind of way was in 1539. And in 1539, the government of France uh, took data that the Catholic Church had been collecting for many years um, and used it as the basis, the, the base database for what became the French national identification system. And that data, what was in it was uh, occurrences, right? So it was data that related to, you, you know, someone has been born someone has been married, someone bought land or you know, earned land, uh, someone died, someone got a divorce, um, whatever it was, um, but it was vital occurrences throughout time. And that was how we defined a person's identification. It was what are the events that are happening in their life. Now, flash forward to, you know, and this is a whitewash version of this, but uh, flash forward to about the 1930s, 1920s, and we start hearing a questions around identity that are not related to occurrences. They're more related to innately, like who, what are you, who are you? And like, what are you made of in terms of race, in terms of genetic traits, in terms of all of these other aspects of identification. And that fundamentally changed the way that we viewed identity and what kind of data we wanted to collect for national ID systems. And naturally the types of data changed and we have what was then what the Nazi party had as, a, as an identity registry um, and what other countries eventually had as identity, identity systems but collected the type of data that is a lot more sensitive. And we uh, see the early stages of biometric data as like an interest area for building these systems. And so now we're at this phase again, where we're trying to redefine what identity is going to mean moving forward in the digital space. And we're still building, by the way, decentralized systems in intention, but all of this data is like using AWS and IBM cloud and all of these like centralized servers using centralized data collection uh, companies that are building the IOT software that are using centralized, uh, you know, cellular protocols. And so we have a long way to go in terms of decentralization. We have a long way to go in terms of real sovereignty and autonomy when it comes to the individual. And so my 
problem with using the term is actually more related to the unconscious way we are defining digital identity moving forward and uh, the way it is presented in contrast with the actual uh, system as it is today, rather than where we want it to head. Um, and then what that fundamentally means to what identification will mean in the digital space moving forward and how much reliance uh, we will have in these kinds of systems uh, moving forward. If we are you know, talking about unintended consequences, we have many, many years, centuries even of experience in you know, data collection that relates to the, the human person uh, gone wrong. And so we just have to be really mindful of the way that, that the term is used as well. Um, and it just comes from my background in like dealing with undocumented immigration with refugees with um, very sensitive cases that relate to paper based documentation. So I like everything Matthew has spoken really speaks deeply to me. But I also am mindful of um, the way that we unconsciously define this term for people um, today. Okay, yeah, well, that's a lot of information. Definitely, that that <laughs> great. you've got you've got a lot of great depth of, of 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 knowledge there, right? So I think identity is 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 a continuing challenge, right? Okay. And how we define it, who define it, where you define it, which country, how you do that. Uh, but yes, so you're really concerned more about the term uh, self-sovereign identity rather than the, the actual technology yeah. behind, that's behind it, right? So, uh, and I think that's that's important to point out, definitely. I mean both. Because again, we're using centralized cloud, but uh, but both in, in the polit like in associating identification with political rights, with uh, you know it, it, transnational rights, and, and all of these these factors is really a question of um, that is constantly on my mind, and how much uh, a person understands of the the nuances of sovereign identity. I think is something that we just have to keep ever present. So it's, I don't like the term, yes, but I am a big believer in the actual technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think it's done amazing things for, 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 for Kiva, done amazing things in Sierra Leone and, and enabled many people. But I think, yeah, this identity. Like question is, yeah, of Matthew's, like, I've been following you, you know, since we first met years ago. So I, uh, I'm i a big fan and I'm a big fan of the achievements. It's just really a, a cognizant, um, I think in the humanitarian sector, uh, there is sensitivity around this concept. And I just think we have to figure this yeah. figure this out in a way that, it, that um, allows people to understand what it is that they're, the system that they're being put into, plugged into, uh, for the next, you know, decades. Okay, so we're now coming coming to the end. Uh, so I think I'd just like to ask one quick question, actually. Um, uh, how do people get involved? So obviously, I think it's open source people. How would you advise people if they want to get involved in this kind of blockchain and humanitarian journey? Maybe we'll quickly go around that. And then I'm going to ask you a quick question, uh, a quick rapid round question. So Lucia. Sure. I'll, I'll, okay, Rick, great. Go Rick, no, Rick, Rick, you go ahead. Okay, all right, and I've got a real short answer too. Number one, number one, yeah. if you don't have one already, download and install a digital wallet, learn how to custody your own coins, learn how to do transactions, get familiar with this stuff. Number two, learn a programming language. Go out and learn a programming language. And someplace like uh, the Hyperledger community is a great place to start. Uh, there's so many smart people there. There's so many helpful people there. Uh, in short, get involved, get your feet wet, start developing fluency with the fundamental tools that come with this technology. And then you will figure out what's the right path for you. That's the way to get involved. Okay, excellent. So th I think maybe I'll just go to the wrap round and a question at the end, right? So I think you covered it beautifully, Rick. <laughs> so basically get involved in the technology, understand it, get involved in the open source community, uh, just get out there, right? Don't be afraid, just get involved. Uh, so uh, quick question around uh, for, for each of you. One app between, there's a number between one and 10, 10 being uh, you know, uh, good and, and one and 10. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's between one and 10, good. So number between one and 10, what, how would you describe um, where we, how we're using blockchain uh, in humanitarian sets today, one out of 10 today, and how do you think we're gonna be looking like in five years time between one and 10? So how we are today between one and 10 and where you think we're gonna be in 10 years between one and 10. And I'm going to do this in reverse alphabetical order. So Rick. <laughs> You're on mute, Rick. You're on mute. You're on mute, buddy. You're a mute. Yeah, well, that was because I really didn't want to be the first one to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that today we're somewhere in the area of three or four. Oh, okay. Uh, where are we going to be in 10 years? With the pace of change in this sector, we're going to be at nine or 10. Okay. Excellent. I like that. That's positive. So now you've got a, a base. Matthew, where would you go from here? 
Yeah, I'd probably go a little lower than Rick on both. I'd probably say today we're like at a, a one, like between a one and a two, we're like at a one and a half. And then I think in five years, we'll be at a five or six in okay. the humanitarian sector. Well, I'm, I'm just going to sit comfortably and I'm going to agree with Matt on where we are today. And I'd say I'm also on the one to two camp. Um, but I do think that the pace of innovation is awesome. And I think that the change in uh, the attitudinal change that has been taking place over the past year and a half, um, I'm pretty optimistic that we'll be at an eight or a nine in the future. I will say that uh, in, in recognition of objective fact, I have a track record of being overly optimistic about the sector in this regard. So just FYI. <laughs> I don't have to explain what I do anymore. And I think that is making me super optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I haven't had to talk about Mount Gox in quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you all. I think we're going to wrap up here. Uh, this has been an amazingly wonderful conversation. You know, such great panelists, such great knowledge. And, and we had such a short time. Uh, we'll have to do this again, I think, soon. Uh, uh, thank you, the whole audience, uh, for listening. Uh, and so yet again, thank you, uh, Lucia. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, BSN, uh, for helping organize this. And uh, take care, everyone. And please, keep, you know, please uh, look after yourself uh, and get involved. All right. Take care, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.